what kind of blue tongue skink makes the best pet. You are watching Reptile Mountain TV. Evidence-based, captive bred, and animal focused. Welcome to Reptile Mountain TV. I'm TC Houston, a former professional AZA zookeeper and small batch reptile breeder with over 30 years of experience keeping reptiles in both the university, zoo, and private sector. Now today, we're going over what blue tongue species or subspecies, what type of blue tongue might be the best pet for you. Real fast, before we get too deep into what species might be best for you, would you all go check out my sponsors, Healthy Herp Instant Meals, which you can pick up on Amazon. Just search Healthy Herp Instant Meals, or you can follow the link down in the description. And would you go check out Cage's Custom Reptile Enclosures. These are my sponsors. I use both of them routinely for the care and maintenance of my animals. Now, if you go to reptilecages.com slash reptilemountain, and that's cages with a K. The link will be in the description. And use that link, which is an affiliate link, and you add to your cart the little door handle slides. When you purchase a, a cage, you will get those door handle slides for free. So go check them out. Show them some love because they support this channel and they support ethical reptile care. Okay, so today we're going to go over the animals that are reasonably available outside of the continent of Australia. Aussies, I love y'all, but you are kind of an island. Well, you're, you're actually literally an island, but you're also isolated because of the 1982 Wildlife Protection Act. None of your animals can be exported to the rest of the world, and no external animals, no non-native species can be legally imported without special permits for being a zoo. So the species that you can have are native to Australia, and that kind of limits our discussion. So we're gonna talk in America about the animals that are reasonably available. Now when I say reasonably available, I mean that they are available for sale every year, and reasonably meaning that their price point is within the average American household's discretionary monthly income. So what is that? Well, according to the Bureau of uh, labor statistics or one of those bureaus, whatever, the average American household discretionary income, that's money after bills, is between one to $2,000. It's actually like $1,750 or something like that. It's closer to $2,000. But mm, just for the sake of argument, let's just go with $1,000 at that way bottom line there. And so those animals are going to be the Eastern Blue Tongue Skink, the Northern Blue Tongue Skink, the Tanambar Island Blue Tongue Skink, so those three spe uh, skinkoides species. And then when you get into the Gigas, so you're going to have your Marauques, your Toleco Gigas Gigas Halmahera type, and your Toleco Gigas Kiensis, the Key Island, and your Toleco Gigas Gigas, the classic Indonesian. And let's not forget the Toleco SP, your Irian Jaya. So those are the animals that we're going to talk about as being the best pet lizards that are reasonably available. Okay, so the categories that I'm gonna kinda use to determine which one might be best, which uh, species or subspecies that is, I'm gonna use, first of all, I'm gonna use temperament, like behavior handleability, and I'm also gonna use captive maintenance. Those are the two biggest parts of making an animal the best pet. How much you can interact with them, or if that's what you're looking for at least, and what kind of behavior they have. And then also, we're gonna talk about how easy or hardy they are to care for, and how simple captive maintenance or difficult it can be. So those are the two big items. Of course, there is gonna be other variabilities. They all are gonna need about the same size enclosure, and if you're interested in an enclosure, I recommend the Reptile Mountain Edition by Cages at Cages Custom Reptile Enclosures uh, com slash Reptile Mountain. That four by two by two is pristine and will work great for any blue tongue species you choose. So that link's down in the description, and I know that was totally a shameless plug. But the enclosure and the supplies, that's all gonna be pretty much similar, so that's a wash, so we're gonna throw that out. 
But there is another thing about upfront cost, the cost of the animal. Now, I've already mentioned that these all fall within the average low end of the American discretionary income. So it's really not going to be that much of a discussion point. The high end is around the $900 mark. The low end is about $175. Now, if you spread that out, because this animal should live into their 20s, they should live into their 20s if well cared for with you know decent luck. And honestly, they, sh they could even go into their 30s. And so if you're looking at that and you spread that over time, the upfront cost, the difference at that point is pennies, pennies a month or day. And so I'm really not going to discuss whether or not one's better or worse based on the upfront cost and their actual price. I do believe that patience and saving and delay adds value and is a virtue. And it's a character trait that is something that shows uh, genuine value for the animal and value for the event of acquiring the animal. That being said, um, I understand that money is tight for some folks, but if money is your absolute bottom line, then I'm not really 100% sure that this channel and even keeping animals is, is, is really in your wheelhouse at this point. Uh, until money can be something that's not the first focus, then we probably shouldn't be having animals. So let's move on to talking about the other factors that really do set these guys apart. So first, let's look at captive maintenance. Now there is one thing that separates a whole chunk of these animals from another chunk of these animals. And so that's gonna immediately shift everything to put some as more uh, more better, more better I guess is a word, hmm. uh, whereas some are just not less ideal because their their care is more complex. Everything else in the, the blue tongue care is pretty much the same across the species. There's some variability but it's only nuanced so there's not going to be a significant issue. The biggest and number one variable that does absolutely make or break is humidity. So uh, that, that's a thing. And if you go to any forum or on any of the social medias and you go to the blue tongue stuff and you kind of just look at what people are having consistent difficulty maintaining, figuring out, and tuning in, it is humidity. It is like the nemesis. And it, it's honestly, it's not that difficult once you get it, but getting to that area and getting that practice and truly getting there isn't an easy uphill battle for some. So, because of the humidity factor, I am going to kind of, I'm gonna piss off a lot of people here and say that basically anything that requires an elevated level of humidity above typical ambient humidity of a household between 30 to 50%, so anything that's gonna require more than 50% isn't going to be the best pet blue tongue categorically in general. Now, everybody's blue tongue is perfect for them if it's perfect for them, and so everybody's got their own thing. So if you really love tropical animals and you're all into humidity stuff, then it is the best pet for you. Any of those could be if you're looking at those. But I'm looking at categorically someone who has no idea about reptiles coming in going, which best skink should I get? What skink is best for me? Uh, and they have no idea how to manage humidity. They know I'm not. It is one less hurdle if we don't add that, which is Erian Jaya's, all of the Taliqua Gigas, so that's your Halmaheras, your classic Indonesians, your Marauke's, your Key Islands, and then also your Tanabar Island, Blue Tongue, Taliquas, Kinkoides, and Chimera. So those animals, anything that's going to require that higher level humidity is not going to make it into the next round as far as the best pet skink in general. And we're going to look at what's left. What's left out of that list is the northern and the eastern, Taliqua skinkoides skinkoides and Taliqua skinkoides intermedia. So now let's get into those. All right, as far as captive maintenance of easterns and northerns go, not a lot of difference. Uh, these are all easterns and northerns, and they're set up the exact same with the same temperatures and the same everything. The only difference is I allow my easterns to have a night temperature drop so the temps go down at night, and that's about it. So, and Easterns can do a little bit better, or they do fine with a little bit cooler basking area. 
and they do better or fine with a little bit less humidity than a northern. So a northern lives in a true tropical area just like the Indonesian species except for the northern territory and part of Western Australia and Eastern um, and Queensland where the northerns are found in that region. It, it has pockets of moisture and so these animals have learned to move from little pockets of moisture through the arid dry areas to another pocket of moisture and then they also have a wet and dry season. So they've learned to tolerate the drier area and the, the wet. So northerns have a big capacity for humidity unlike the Indonesian species which is much smaller. And so, and Easterns have a lower need for humidity because most of the Easterns are found along the East Coast down into where it's a little bit more Mediterranean. It's not quite as tropical. It's not quite as densely wet. And so Easterns do well, um, quite well at normal human or normal household humidity and Northerns do well at Northern house, normal household humidity. However, they might need a little bit of spraying pre-shed they do a little bit better with a slightly higher humidity but it's just nuanced so overall they're almost identical in care all right guys the last influential thing that we can determine which is the best is behavior so we're going to look at both how they behave in their enclosure and how they behave out of their enclosure with handling. So in their enclosure, to compare these two, the eastern and the northern, as far as boldness, if you want them to be a good display animal, you want to walk in and they don't run and hide, but you get to see your pet. Uh, it's a 50-50 toss-up, to be honest with you. Uh, in my experiences with hundreds of northerns and almost 50 easterns, it's half and half. I literally about half of my Easterns will run and hide when I can enter the room and half of my Easterns sit out and be like, hey, what's up? How you doing? And the exact same thing for my Northerns. So there, I can't tell a difference. I've heard other breeders say that Northerns are more bold. I've heard other breeders say Easterns are just as bold as Northerns and there's no difference. I have been in that camp where I haven't heard Easterns being more timid, to be honest with you. So. I'm going to say right now that that's a wash. So behavior in the enclosure, it's going to boil down to your individual animal and how you set up your enclosure, where your enclosure is, and how you work with your animal. Now let's move over to handling because that does have some very significant differences. Well, it's nuanced again, but still enough for us to make a decision today. And it is this. I have never personally been bit by an eastern blue tongue skink. I have been bit many times by northern blue tongue skinks. I have had my hat bit once by an eastern, and to be fair, she had just flown from New Zealand and then drove, she didn't drive and she didn't fly. She was in the airplane, shipped from New Zealand, imported, and then at the port in Houston, checked out and then drove, drove by me from Houston here to Colorado, and then unpacked and being inspected, and she'd had a really long trip. So to be fair, she'd kind of been in a, a bad go, and she did bite my hat and that is Berserker, and she is huffy and a little bit crazy. But I've never been bit from her directly, and I have never been bit since. She's a little nuts, and she is huffy, but um, that's the only time she's ever bit, and that's the only one ever in all of the Easterns that I've, I've personally worked with it in my own collection and other people's collections all over. I've never had a concern from an Eastern, ever. I do have those concerns when I work with Northerns. Currently, right now, I have a couple Northerns that will come flying out of their enclosure mouth open like a crocodile ready to kill. Um, I know that that's some sort of defensive behavior, but I'll tell you right now, it feels very aggressive when it's my, when you're on the other end of Mr. Attack Monster. Uh, I, most, of, most of the baby Northerns that I've worked with would bite at some point in time. About 25% are totally chill. Um, after a little bit of work, it gets up to about 80% are totally chill, and they are relatively calm. There are some that aren't and are just not pleasant. Most of them can be worked with through behavior and taming. So, based on that, and a lot of new owners want to engage with their animal uh, and kind of be fearless about it. A healthy respect, but fearless about it. Northerns aren't evil, nasty attack monsters. 
they're they you know eight out of ten can be great but 9.99 out of 10 Easterns can be great. Easterns are the most chill from my experience and from what I've heard from other breeders. Therefore, I am saying today, based on all that data, that the Eastern Blue Tongue Skink makes the best pet in general for a new skink owner. Congratulations to the Eastern Blue Tongue. A second place close runner-up is the northern they're both captive bred they're both sustainable they're both available in the united states they're both beautiful and variable and an awesome hardy species but at the end of the day the eastern because of that handleability piece top notch so thank you guys so much for watching if you get a chance and you want to subscribe please do so and check out some of these new videos coming. Well, you can't do it yet, but they're coming. A uh, whole bunch on taming and on handling and enrichment. A lot of good stuff coming up. I want to say thank you to my patrons and to all of you who have subscribed and are watching. I really appreciate you and all my supporters. Guys, thank you for watching. I'm TC Houston, and remember, opinion is not fact.